Welcome to uh, Teachers Teaching Teachers at a very special time on Saturday afternoon here and um, Saturday evening in Germany where Daniel Glick is, the director of A Place to Stand um, that has just recently been released. And um, two people, Denise and um, Kim, who uh, will introduce themselves in a second, who have written a book and, and done some curriculum work and um, around uh, Jimmy Santiago, Santiago Baca's poetry. Um, so it's delightful to have people who have made art around Jimmy's work <laughs> with us. Chris Sloan is with us as well. Um, you know, we, we, one, of the, one of the wonderful things I'll say right away, and it's how we got connected about A Place to Stand, is how much you guys crowdsourced, um, and Daniel, I'll say. And, and so I was proud to wait for the credits at the end and see my name there. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, uh, amongst the thousands and thousands of <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, but but certainly it, it, that whole process um, involved a lot of people and have us now really interested to see the movie. So that's that's kind of exciting. Um, so we had you on a couple years ago to talk about that process, but now we can talk about the movie itself. So I'm excited to do that. Daniel, do you want to introduce yourself and um, and then Denise as well? Yeah, I uh, I started working on uh, a place to stand. This a documentary film based on Jimmy Santiago Baca's memoir about four years ago. Uh, so I'm, I come from a film background. I direct and produce and. Uh, and I read Jimmy's memoir about five years ago, and I was really, really moved by it, so I contacted him to make a film on that story. And, and that's how it started. It took me about a year to get the courage to go out there and just start making it, and, and it, it evolved over the last four years. Uh, the, the team was initially just me and one of Jimmy's sons, Gabe, Gabe Baca, and it grew. And then this, we did three Kickstarter campaigns, and in the second Kickstarter campaign, that's when I connected and got to know Denise and Kim. And Denise was a uh, kind of came on board first, and then Kim came on board, and both were really, really big supporters of the film. And then that led into. Uh, curriculum book that they wrote that is a complement to the movie. Yeah, we'll get back to some of that story because I'm anyway. I mean, I, I was just looking at some of the videos, and you're you know you have this handheld video with and, and you know with the sky in the background, and some of those are really kind of wonderful. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, Denise and Kim, do you want to introduce yourselves? And I'm not going to butcher the title of your. A wonderful title, but it's a long title of your book. So if you could talk about that a little bit. Go ahead, Denise. Start. Okay, um, I'm Denise Van Briggle, and I'm a former director of the Capital Area Writing Project at Penn State Harrisburg. And as Daniel said, we connected along the way. And Jimmy has this way of uh, getting people to sort of be his emissaries. And um, Kim and I both went um, on the road, so to speak, with uh, with the film and. In the process, Jimmy asked Kim and I if we would work on a complement to uh, the film, and it's called Feeding the Roots of Self-Expression and Freedom. And we're really excited to, to be coming to the uh, National Writing Projects meeting and uh, looking very forward to sharing the book with all of you after the before and after the screening at the annual meeting. So that's going to be on Thursday, right? So somebody's right. watching this and saying, "Oh, I'd I'd like to see the movie." That's one way. Um, but yeah, great. Kim, I'm I'm Kim Sheehan, and I'm here in Port Charlotte, Florida, and I work with teachers every day as a curriculum specialist, and had the pleasure of just kind of running into Jimmy at a conference that I went to and we just immediately bonded and as Denise said he has this unique way of putting people together who love words and writing and reading and just kind of 
it, it just sprang out of that. And when he said, would you like to take these poems and write a book? Of course, I said yes. Um, and I'm associated with the Tampa Bay Area Writing Project here in Florida at USF. Very cool. So, Chris, do you have any? I, want you to uh, I mean, yeah, I contribute. In here. Yeah. Carter, I uh, teach media and English at Judge Memorial in Salt Lake City, Utah, and so I'm associated with the Wasatch Range Writing Project in Utah. And um, you know, I teach a lot of. I mean, Utah, so there's a lot of Hispanic students, and um, so some years I've taught a lot of, um, particularly Mexican American literature. Uh, Chicano literature, so um, I mean, I was really intrigued by it, and then, you know, his the way he pulls himself out of where he was is just inspirational, and reminds me of some other things I teach too. So I'll maybe talk about that if there's time later. Yeah, and just I, again, I'm Paul Ellison, and I teach in New, in the Bronx, and um, one of the one of the things as I was watching the movie, uh, even last night I was watching it. Um, the um, I, I I'm, I'm have my students in my in mind, and you know, many of them have had difficult um, childhoods, um, losing parents and so forth. So the, the identity and and you know, many of them are unfortunately um, connected to some of the. Violence and drugs and uh, the prison system and their families are too. So, yeah, um, I was watching it with their eyes as well um, last night. So just to say, but Daniel, do you want to talk more about how you um, like how you? I, I guess it's not the courage, but I, what, what was that beginning stuff like? Um, went out there with the camera. He invited you in. Uh, how did that work out? Yeah. Some of that never ends up in the final thing, right? But yeah. No, it, yeah, I mean the yeah, I mean it's it's a lot happened. It's a long it was a long adventure. Um I I had I discovered a place to stand through an incarcerated uh friend uh of a friend in Auburn prison in upstate New York and and that's how I was introduced to the book and I I wrote Jimmy an email and uh, and we corresponded for a few days. I was asking him if I could make a documentary about his story, and and he and he said yes. And when I so when I first went out there, it was like we had no money. We had like, I, I I bought a Greyhound ticket, <laughs> a one way Greyhound ticket to Albuquerque, and uh, and then and then fortunately my mother's cousin just gave me a car out of the blue so I was able to drive out and um, and yeah we just started filming I mean I had some equipment and Jimmy's son Gabe had some equipment he had a camera so we started interviewing Jimmy and filming him doing different things I mean the that one photo is we filmed him walking down to the Rio Grande and talking about the Rio Grande and um, his relationship, kind of reflecting on nature, and I mean, at, at the beginning, we didn't really know what it would be. Uh, we we knew the basic story, but we thought there might be other parts. There might be you know, parts about him and his life today. Uh, so we started filming a lot, and then and then as we started to edit the film, it became clear that the story, like where all, where all the juice was, was to uh, was to tell his story, like the, the story that he told in his memoir. So that was that was how it began. It, it started out like that, and um, and as we started to edit the piece, it just became more and more and more clear. And we moved away from sort of a contemporary look at his work and his life, and and went straight into the the story, focused on the story, and. Uh, that he wrote in his book. And oh, I, by the way, I wanted to identify pretty early on um, spo uh, that uh, I want to be able to talk about the, the movie, and so spoiler, spoiler alerts, you know, um, I don't think we should worry about that if that's okay. Um, there is a book on so. <laughs> yeah. so just to say. So uh, the, the, um, 
one of the things I was struck by, and just uh, and when you talk about telling his story, is that it's not an easy story to tell. You know, it's not like he had this, you know, change of heart suddenly. Uh, just before he's getting out, you we're, we're talking about you know doing some violence, and you know, there's you know, so. I don't know. I, I don't know what the question was there, but <laughs> but you know, did 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 you? How did you? I, I mean, I think the the film captures that. It, it's not. It doesn't um, doesn't make anything easy. You know. No, I mean, I I didn't want like I I wanted it to like I wanted to capture the kind of the full range of what Jimmy's story means and. And and it was you know when he got out of prison it wasn't it wasn't like everything was perfect and everything was wonderful it was he was he came out with a lot of baggage and a lot of demons on his back because of that experience um, but he also came out with this amazing gift to write poetry which was a kind of the a way for him to pull back as much as he was able from the violence um, so it was like a lifeline for him and. So I, I mean, I wanted. I just wanted. I didn't want to paint Jimmy as a saint, as this ideal saint. Um, you didn't. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wanted to present him as he is and was, um, which was like he, he. In that story, he embodies the full range of human experience, and you know, he embodies the the dark side. Um, there are moments of, of kind of the almost getting like almost stepping over the line in terms of darkness and 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 anger and rage and violence and then there's extreme love and um, passion and open-heartedness and compassion and empathy and so he, he he has that full range and I think his willingness to speak about it openly and communicate it can help others see all these parts in themselves too and accept these parts of themselves because this is what he went through is an extreme but it's the same dynamics that go on in everyone so I, I wanted to I didn't want to do like some simple tie up with a bow everything's wonderful mm -hmm. just keep it as real as possible and uh, yeah use, use it as a way to impact the viewer a little bit more, may make them reflect on themselves and maybe what's in and you know, what what it, is it in themselves that is goes along with Jimmy's story. How what can they learn from him uh, as an example? I think that's that's one of the most powerful thing elements of this story is that it's kind of a, a profound meditation on what it is to be a human. So. Uh, and and the, the, capa the enormous capacity for change uh, and growth. So, yeah, that's. What? Daniel, I'd like to say that you know, ha being as intimate as I am with Jimmy's poetry, I, I found that so many of those visual fade in, fade outs, and all the things that were done in the film, just visually captured the essence of many of those poems. And like you said, that kind of, that really dark, dark, dark side. But then there are these beautiful lucid moments of light and love and everything that's kind of enveloped in that poetry. So for me watching that, that was just like, it, it was just a big wow. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I'm glad it worked out. I mean, I can't take full credit. I mean, there, there was Gabe, and we had an amazing director of photography, Michael Gordon, and I mean, I think, uh, and, and an incredible executive producer who was kind of helping to shape those pieces and guide the process. I, but, but that was hard. I mean, the, trying to figure out what to put on the, like, with, to, to accompany and complement the sections of poetry was tough. Because my experience of watching films with poems uh, like other movies that have poetry in them is for me it sort of like takes takes me out of the action and 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 oftentimes steps across the line into cheesiness and so I wanted to 
as much as possible to whatever degree of success that we could try to try to make it work and it, and, re, and it often required like shooting for days to get one shot <laughs> like try because you know you don't really know what it'll be until you actually put it with the poem and so it was a lot you know we have hours we have tens of dozens of hours of just that kind of footage because we didn't know exactly what would work um, can, can, can you be more specific on that like what a time when you shot, like, what did you shoot for days, and then what, what poem was it connected to? Sorry to put you on the spot, but... No, 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 that's okay. I mean, I, I think of, like, there was... But it, and I mean, and what I'm saying applies to all of the visuals, like, even in Jimmy's story. And so, like, one, one, I'm, one that I'm thinking about is that the... that last uh, story that you mentioned about Jimmy almost killing someone mm -hmm. right before he gets out is... Um, there was, he talks about how he saw some guy hit someone with a bat, and, um, and, and so we went out to a baseball field and spent like a day shooting in this baseball field to see, uh, see what worked, and, and we came back and none of it worked. So it was, like, it was just an entire day of driving out to the west side of Albuquerque and shooting and be, trying to be creative, and it didn't pay off. And so, uh, and then we may have even tried something else um, for that one, but and then ultimately figured out okay, two photos make it work. So it was, yeah. So that that's what I mean. I, I mean, and a lot of it too is when we had our director of photography, he came to Albuquerque, and we shot in Albuquerque. Then we went to Arizona, and we shot in Arizona, and then we went to Montana, where we shot in an abandoned prison in Montana, and and. We, we just made a list of as many ideas as we could possibly think of, of stuff that could work, and then we just shot and shot and shot for 10 hours a day. So, so that's, and that's, and we sort of picked, picked what we could from that, and then, and then my, you know, and then afterwards, I was like, okay, this doesn't work here. We, we still need a piece, and so our director of photography would shoot stuff in his studio in Alabama, and and he wasted some days <laughs> shooting stuff that we didn't use. <laughs> we we're like, oh, maybe this could work, and he sent it, and it didn't work. And, um, so it was just it was experimentation, and I, mean, I, I was sort of I was operating on the gut instinct, and uh, wasn't like an intellectual. It was an intellectual process to try to come up with ideas, but if it if it made me cringe when I watched it, <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's a sign that I we need something else. I was um, in the hallway recently and I heard, overheard a teacher explaining the difference between a feature film and a documentary. And she said, you know, and the kids weren't going very far with it. And she said, well, are there actors in um, documentaries? Are there, it's like, but every kind of distinction she was making, I was like wanting to push back on. And like, but it, so it sounds like, you know, you're making a documentary, but you're telling a story, right? I mean, it's a narrative you're building. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. I don't know. I, I saw this. I read this really good interview with Mike, uh, or a speech that Michael Moore gave. That he was like, "Stop calling it a fucking documentary." He's like, "It's it's a film," and 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 I think like there's nowadays, especially, it seems like the line is being blurred between the two more and more. Um, there are elements of a of a narrative film, or like a, a, a yeah narrative film, um, kind of being mixed with documentary film. Uh, I mean, for me, it would be like a a, a a narrative film is scripted completely with actors, and a documentary is has unscripted parts, uh, if not if not entirely unscripted. And but for me, a documentary is is based on, or it's like built on unscripted pieces, and you know stuff that you can't really control while you're shooting, and and that's the heart of a documentary. And with a narrative film, uh, it's scripted by and large. Like it's it's based on being a script. So like for me, a feature film just means the length of a film. So this is a feature documentary film. 
with narrative elements. I mean, the, the lines are getting are pretty blur, blurry at times because we, we had actors for like four or five shots in this. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other people have thoughts? <laughs> well, I guess I'm wondering about the educators then, you know, how they turn that into something like, you know, why do you think that that's a good idea for other teachers? You know, why create a resource and then how did that start and how did that kind of morph as you went through the process? In terms of the, uh, the book of, of poetry or, okay. Yeah, uh, Kim and I, we received this huge um, number of poems. Jimmy's uh, son Gabe and Daniel went to Stanford University to the archives and they um, called through all of these poems and just kind of sent them to us raw. So Kim and I had um, an opportunity to read every one of them and make selections as to how to order them in the resource. Um, I, I do have a copy of it here. Yeah. Um, okay. These are unpublished poems? Uh, yes. These were, yes, these were poems that had, uh, I, I think a few of them may have been published in other places, but not many, I will say that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what I think is so fascinating about the poems that we worked with is it really, they show Jimmy's emergent voice. I mean, he was a young, very young man when he was penning these poems in prison, and he's gone on to write, you know, so many other um poems in his mature years and, and more to come, I'm sure, but I loved working, and I, I know, I can I think I can speak for Kim too, loved working with these very raw, real uh, words of this young man who was, you know, imprisoned, and I believe that the book, um, and Kim, we worked very hard to try um, as best we could to fashion something that would be appealing to uh, high school students, college students, um, folks that are still incarcerated, young and old, and also a resource that just a general um, person who may or may not love words could pick up and dip into and find something really compelling and valuable. Um, I had recently had the opportunity to work with Jimmy in Minnesota. We went to a, a, a conference called Survive and Thrive there, and they brought together a group of high school students from one of the... Uh, yeah, survive and what? Uh, it's called Survive and Thrive. Do you remember, Rex? Survive and Thrive. Survive and Thrive, yes. It starts uh, with the heart. It's a very sort of eclectic conference that they've put together at uh, St. Cloud University that draws together art and writing and so forth. So during, during that time, they pulled together this group of high school students, um, they were in a sort of um, an alternative type setting, and their administrators and uh, teachers and students from the university came to work with us with, um, with the, this resource. And, you know, I, the night before I was really kind of looking and saying, which poems might we use? And so I had dog-eared, you know, maybe a dozen of them. And just as Jimmy spoke, I felt compelled to select one poem. So I selected one poem, and with that one poem, we spent three hours with just one poem out of the collection, spent three hours working with these students. It was just absolutely incredible what they, what they turned out just after hearing this one poem and doing some free writing. So the, the administrators were amazed too, um, and you know they just couldn't believe how much was revealed um, in this safe. Uh, container that we created with the uh, with the students. So um, I'm really excited about the potential for you know where this can where this can go in so many different settings. I also work in the with the prisons here in Pennsylvania. I'm the um, co-convener of the Dolphin Chapter of the Pennsylvania Prison Society. So I'm looking forward to having opportunities to work with you know, some incarcerated um, individuals, too, in the future. But right now, I have only tested the waters with, uh, with students at this point. And the film indicates that Jimmy has gone back to work in prisons. How much has he done that? Is that a lot of what he does, or...? It's, I think it's a mix. Uh, 
now. I think um, I mean I don't I don't know the exact number of how many prisons he's gone to in the last years. I mean I know he but he did he did a lot of he did prison workshops like, pretty soon after he got out um, in North Carolina, and then he I mean I know he's done workshops in New Mexico and uh, I think he he teaches more in schools and and universities than prisons but um, but if he's invited to, to prisons I, I, I believe he he's gone you know yeah well he, cer he, he certainly has as a matter of fact he was invited to go to Montgomery um, I think there's a Montgomery jail in DC when he's uh, coming for the uh, the National Writing Project but his schedule isn't going to allow that but it looks like a really wonderful program that they have. Um, I believe it's called One Step, if I'm not mistaken, where they try to get um, the inmates ready to move back into um, into society, into the mainstream. So um, he's keeping that on the back burner, I know, as a possi possibility for a future time. So, Kim or Denise, I, could you, this may be an unfair question, but could you summarize sort of the, the kernel of your pedagogy in the book. Um, Denise, w what you were saying sounded like it was using the poetry as kind of prompts for your own writing. Um, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Kim. I think a lot of it can be internalized and reflective. Uh, what we did was we kind of set it up for that hero's journey because he basically brought himself up from the depths of hell just as it's described in the film mm -hmm. and into the light and what we did is we provided some questioning and things like that to help you think about the poem or for those who love poetry and words on their own they can just read the poems and skip that part we also provided some paired text in there and past you know that could be used to further study in different areas and cross-curricular. Right. I should also mention that I think you know it was very intentional. The beginning of the book has more scaffolding. It's a darker. It's the darker sort of poetry that um, that Jimmy shared with us that appears in the beginning of the book. And so more scaffolding there. The end is a little lighter and. Um, fewer, um, you know, scaffolds are are in place for that. It's a little more, um, a little more question driven than than the beginning of the book. So, so, Denise and Kim, did you get to see uh, rushes of the film and versions of the film before the rest of us? Or uh... <laughs> yes, we did. Actually, I, I mean, I, it was wonderful because, I, as Daniel said, I've been a, a strong supporter and contributor from the start and along the lines um, you know of the filming he would send us little uh, you know I know I saw the um, a very early uh, an early piece and I remember reacting and saying oh I really love this one part <laughs> and he was like the next time I talked to him he was like oh well that was cut <laughs> so, so um, you know but it, actually what it what came into place uh, to, to replace this. Actually, it was the very segment where, and you, you gentlemen, uh, Chris and Paul will, and Kim has seen this already, but where Jimmy is sort of getting that um, spark, this, this real spark that turns into this fire about words. And in the beginning, uh, one, of the, one of the segments was, was sort of like cartoonish and showed ink blots and all kinds. So um, it's been replaced with this a little more um, subdued um, piece with words leading to words leading to words and opening up this whole you know, world of uh, you know, literacy for, uh, for Jimmy. And there, it's, it's beautiful. I really love that segment as it stands, although I have to say I did like the earlier. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just curious about your collaboration too, because you mentioned how uh, you know it kind of maybe got cut or whatever. But like when you saw some of the things, um, you know, Denise and Kim, did you think like, oh, we should think about the book differently? Or Daniel, when you, if you came across some of the poems that they liked, did you, did that factor into the the filming? Was there a collaboration like that, or I'm just curious? It was it was more of like it was just a it was a parallel process like we were we we didn't have a 
a lot of um, a lot of intersection along the way, except kind of just checking in and moral support for each other. Um, and we, you know, we would send them, uh, you know, we'd share cuts of the film or scenes here and there. Uh, but but they were, but because like there, there's the film, and then their curriculum book is based around these poems. It's not based around the, the movie. Um, and so there was, it was a parallel tract of of development, and you know, that started. I mean, it started when Gabe and I discovered these poems, and and. I don't remember. I mean, both of us were talking to Jim. He's like, you should, you should do something with these because these are really good, and and they've never been published. So they should be out there in some way. And then that, and that led to him talking with Denise and Kim. But no, but there was it wasn't a collaboration. It was just it was a parallel uh, process working at the same time. I don't think we would have done anything differently. Um, you know, looking at the film, I think the I think what we've produced really is a beautiful complement to um, such a such a moving uh, film that that you've created, Daniel. And I'm really uh, I I truly believe that showing the film ahead of working with uh, with the book is really the way uh, the way to go. And um, yeah, I, I think they complement and they don't detract. Uh, at all from one another. No. What was the collaboration like with Jimmy? Like, how often did you show him the film, and did he say that's that's too corny? You know, don't do that. No, he from the beginning he was like, I don't want any involvement. <laughs> he was really? like, he was just like, I don't want to do it. You, you this is yours, and uh, we sent. I mean, we showed him. Like, I think before the final cut, we showed him like two earlier versions. And both times he was like, "Oh, it's great," and that was <laughs> that was about it. And then, I mean, he didn't he didn't want to be involved in the creative process. He didn't want to give us feedback. He he wanted us to operate independently. And um, he never said anything about like, "Oh, don't take that out or put this in." Or at the very 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 beginning, I remember like sitting down and we were sitting at the table because because Gabe and I were working out of his house for the first. Few months, um, and and he was just like, oh, you should do this image of this, and then the candle blows out, and then you have the picture of the mother, and oh, it'll be beautiful. And <laughs> and, and then that, that, that after those first month or so, when we started kind of developing it on our own, he, he stopped. <laughs> he let go of those ideas. I mean, here he would share ideas. He'd be like, oh, you should talk to this person, or you should talk to this person. But he was never involved in the creative process uh, so much. He would he was just there to support us uh, as we needed him. So we're like, hey man, we need to do our eleventh interview with you. Are you okay with that? <laughs> and he's like, oh yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, he wouldn't he would bust us always. And he would, you know, how, I, to, how many interview? Uh, you say eleventh, but how many did you really do? I mean. And were yeah. they like long, and then you cut them up, or how did? Yeah. I think it was about eleven or twelve interviews. I, th I think it might have been eleven, but um, they they kind of, they got more honed in as time went on. Uh, the the first ones were open. I mean, none of them were that long because Jimmy's very impatient, and so so we would be sitting down and and about twenty minutes, and he'd be like, no, no. Okay, that's it for today. We gotta, we gotta stop. And he's like, no, 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 come on, we gotta do another half hour at least. Uh, but he's, you know, he's has a lot of, a lot of energy, and it's hard for him to sit still. And and I don't think he enjoys being interviewed and talking about this stuff. Uh, he doesn't like it's, it's. I think it's painful for him to revisit this. And so it was. Uh, so the, the interviews they generally lasted about an hour. To two hours, um, and we did uh, about eleven of them over the course of two years. And so the first ones are very open. We're just asking him everything and seeing what came out. And then as they progressed and it became more clear, like what what story we were telling, we we went in a little more deeply into um, what. Uh, well, specifically specific scenes, getting deeper in specific scenes and asking him more specific details about certain things. 
And the last interview was like my, the best one, I think. It is the one that appears the most in the film. Uh, I mean, there, there are two that we see on the screen, but there are pieces of all, all of them in there. And what about the other folks? How did you gather those people? And oh, that was. Uh, I mean, and, and let me just uh, say before you <laughs> go into that, I, I I thought every moment, every time when I th I was thinking, oh, there's another talking head. I don't want to. I like it shifted to another format. So really nice balance in the film that way. I think you must you must have worked on that. <laughs> but, yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, with the with the people, I mean, it was uh, it was the, it was a mix of, of talking, you know, just getting some some of it was getting names from Jimmy, like people, um, or or going through the book and picking out names and asking him about who is this person, who is this person, and I mean, the cooler some of the cooler interviews or the like like his, the former cellmates and stuff. Required some detective work. Are some like, of those guys still in jail? Uh, no, but but well, no, actually, yeah. it might be. He got. We interviewed him when he was three days out of prison. Mm. Uh, uh, and yeah, yeah, it felt like there could be other stories being told <laughs> yeah. with these guys. But good. Yeah, yeah, and one one of them, the bona fide, was in prison when we interviewed him. He was in for forty two years, mm. and. And he got out like last year, finally, and um, yeah. So so we we got lucky. I mean, I I did research and I knew this. And, like I knew their names, their last names, and so I looked up people with those names or those last names in the sp in the places where they could possibly live. And and for a couple of them, I just sent letters. Um, and like for one of them, for Don, for Jimmy's cellmate Donnie, I sent letters to a few different Donald Barnetts in in a few different places, and one of them, and then he called me. He was like, "Oh yeah, that's me." And then the other one, I knew the like Jimmy's cellmate Teo. I knew his last name, and I knew where he was from. So I just sent letters to like three or four or five people. Who might be related to Teo, and ask asking them, "Hey, do you know this guy?" Um, and then I got a call from his sister. So, so there is there is some sleuthing for some of it. It's, it's fun when they paid off though. And were they all eager to talk? I mean, yeah, they were all open to it. Yeah, um, and the I mean, the one who was, I think, most confused was was Teo, <laughs> because he he didn't exactly know what was what you know he got out of prison um, three days before we interviewed him, and it was by coincidence that we were in Texas in the town next to his okay. when he got out. We didn't know that that would happen, and and so I mean, we first interviewed him, and he just started talking about Selena, <laughs> the pop <boss> singer, <laughs> because Selena is from his hometown area, and he's like, oh, yeah, we could go to Selena's grave and shoot that, and we could go, there's a Selena statue, and <laughs> we're like, Gabe and I were like, no, yeah, that's a good idea, I mean, that's <laughs> cool, but that's not exactly what we were doing. <laughs> we'll talk to you, uh, and so... We went to the house and interviewed them, um, but no, every, everyone was was open. I mean, the one guy who was skeptical was the DEA agent who busted Jimmy. Um, we interviewed him, and he didn't make it in the film because he was only involved in one scene, which was the the drug bust, and it was just getting too complicated because his version of the events were different from Jimmy's version of the events, and and so we figured there are some basic facts that were true from both accounts and we would just stick with them and but he was a little like uh, I don't know I don't know but most most everyone was very willing to to be in it I guess um, I'm wondering about the larger kind of um, you know like Daniel you said originally you you met with a friend of a friend in the Auburn prison um, and then I think Denise, you're somehow connected with uh, incarceration, right? 
Um, so it, there's kind of a larger story here too, right? We used to call them penitentiaries and now they're prisons. And there's this whole idea of, I'm thinking of like Malcolm X's transformation in prison and, uh, you know, Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail. Um, I teach a book, Dead Man Walking. You know, there's a lot about our prison um, system <laughs> that well, I suppose is, uh, you know. I want to throw my, my Mia in there too. And his, but, uh, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, I didn't mean to, you mean to interrupt your thought. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, um, so I guess it's like there seems to be also kind of a story about literacy and, and incarceration or like something there, right? Like that drives all of you. Yeah, yeah. I I, I think so. I mean, Denise and Kim, you could talk. Um, well, I know, um, I've worked with a lot of DJJ facilities and kids who get put there from the regular school systems, you know, they get arrested for whatever, their parents leave, they get in trouble. And when Jimmy was here in Port Charlotte, we were working in classrooms writing with kids. And I said, you know, there's a kid who really, really wanted to see you, but he didn't make it. He got thrown into DJJ. And Jimmy said, let's go. Can you call the director? And so I called the director and I brought him out there, and in 30 minutes, he had every one of these kids writing the most amazing and being very vulnerable. And so for me, just being able to get to kids, whether they're incarcerated or in schools and living with incarceration in their childhood or whatever, is, it's, it's a connection that they wouldn't otherwise have, and he connects with them like that. I, yeah. I have to, oh, I'm sorry, Daniel, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I never knew about the, the reality of prison before I visited Auburn. Um, you know, I knew prison was bad, but I didn't realize the extent at which it just destroys lives. And uh, and like when I left Auburn, I was thinking that first visit, I was thinking, okay, anyone who goes through this, who goes through this place, whether it be inmates, guards, or visitors, is not going to come out any better for it on the other side. And that was the the idea of the film. I, uh, initially, was I wanted to make a film that would raise awareness of that reality. But but then when I discovered Jimmy's story, it it, it evolved into more of, okay, I want to create something that could serve these populations. And uh, because Jimmy's story, it, it simply changes people, or it opens people to the possibility of change in themselves. No matter, I think, almost no matter how entrenched in their own uh, kind of violence or kind of darkness or whatever, um, Jimmy's Jimmy's ability to communicate what happened to him, he allows others to see that possibility in themselves. Like his transformation and the way he's able to communicate it creates the opportunity for others to go through a similar process. And that's um, that's ultimately like what drove me to to make the film. I mean a few things did, but one of them one of the primary motivations for me was to create a film, create tell Jimmy's story in, in, in the film format to to enable the possibility of that kind of transformation in others, to open the possibility and, and to to use it as a tool for education, for inspiration. And so that's um, you know, so that's why one of the main approaches we're going to be focusing on in terms of distribution is in the education world, is, is specifically getting it into educational facilities and prisons and detention centers. And so we have, we have Denise and Kim's book to go with that. We have a curriculum book specifically, like, to use scenes from the movie to, uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty short book. Um, and so the, the three... That's out already? No, well, the movie's not out yet. Oh, it's not. Oh, <laughs> it's, a, so it's, all, no. it's all complete, and we're we are um, 
we're going to building the the foundation to launch it in the spring to launch all of it in the spring in a, in a wide way I mean you you got the you got the cup because you you were a generous uh, a generous man at the beginning of our process and so uh, so so we're that's when we'll have all of this available and we'll start the the big push to get um, all the, the movies and the books into the places where they can serve. What I wanted to add was um, my work in Pennsylvania, I, I actually am an official prison visitor, so I go into the prisons and work with incarcerated individuals on many, um, many aspects of their incarceration. It may be, you know, they have problems with medical or the conditions in the prison and so forth, but very recently, I won't name the prison, it is in Pennsylvania, very recently I met with a young man who, uh, you know, is a college graduate who is actually in the whole, um, it's actually called in this particular prison, the restricted housing unit, but had been there for like 70 days, um, scheduled to be there for 375 days, if I'm not mistaken, for, um, you know, something that seemed as though it didn't match you know, the, the, the number of days he was, um, you know, scheduled to be here did not seem to match the infraction. But one of the things that struck me when I was talking with him is, you know, he, was, he talked about the deplorable conditions in, um, in the prison, in this particular, in the hole, so to speak. Um, you know, and a lot of people say to me when they see the film, uh, because I've been at the screenings and I've had a chance to talk to folks, but they're like, oh, things have changed in the prisons. They're, it's not like that anymore. That was the 70s. And I am here to tell you that I know firsthand things have not changed. I mean, this young man is talking about, you know, mice crawling um, all over and in the middle of the night and, uh, you know, being skipped for meals and all sorts of things that are just so inhumane and my motivation for working that, with the book and with Kim and with Jimmy you know is comes from a literacy standpoint but also from definitely Chris from you know the prison uh, standpoint and Kim and I worked very hard on the book to make sure that at the end we included um, ways for people to get involved and to find, you know, for kids um, for, and for young adults and those incarcerated to learn even more about the supports that are out there, some of these organizations that really dedicate, um, you know, every moment to helping improve the prison uh, system in, in the United States and abroad. So, uh, yeah, thank you for mentioning that. I appreciate it. I appreciate having the opportunity to say this on the program. Yeah, yeah. There's there's so much potential for this, um, kind of in in Jimmy's story. Uh, like it, I mean, it speaks directly to incarcerated individuals, to kind of kids who are on on that road, on the way to prison, or connected to that world, gang life, street life, drug life. Um, but I mean, but for me, I mean, the potential is that there's so, there's so many connecting points to the story. There's there's uh, literacy. Just li anyone dealing with literacy, anyone interested in writing and poetry or literature, and there's kind of anyone who's interested in kind of personal growth and development and personal transformation. There's kind of the the fact that he's an incredible role model for Chicano youth and Latino youth, uh, and I think there's a lot of there's just a lot of connecting points uh, for people to get uh, to get something from Jimmy's story, and that's why I was so motivated to to, to do the film, and it's why so many people have supported it. Uh, I believe because it just, it has that potential. I mean, it, it's a it's on one level it's a powerful story, and it's and it's engaging and enter entertaining in some way, but it's very, um, it's just rich and it speaks to kind of the, the, uh, the depth, uh, kind of a depth of humanity that uh, a lot of people yearn for. And yeah, so for me that's what, that's what's so special about 
his story and, and his, you know, there are a lot of people like Jimmy who've learned something in prison or in desperate situations and have come out of that uh, and who have grown. But what's rare about Jimmy's story is that, like, is that he is a master communicator like, or a master storyteller. And so he's able to communicate uh, that journey in a way that, that shifts people uh, and, and kind of connects them to him like, as he's telling the story. And then as he goes through these changes in, in, his, in, in the movie or in the book, um, you can, like, you're kind of riding w along with him. And so you can experience that, you know, what he experienced, uh, and, and get shifted by his journey. And so that's, that's, I mean, that's what happened to me when I read the book. And uh, it's what was interesting for me. And so the, the, the curriculum we have for the, for the movie and the curriculum that Denise and Kim have written all point to like, taking this movie as a starting point and helping to guide students or whoever is a part of the program, whether it be a writing workshop, and along a similar path. Um, not necessarily always through writing, but just helping people find passion, find purpose, find a, a place to stand in their life, and, and kind of learn to look at themselves and love themselves and, uh, and to start to explore something different if it's something they're interested in. So that's that's what motivates me. I mean, and and it's just a, a really it was it was fun. It was a it was a fun, wild, crazy <laughs> process to, to be involved. In. And the process isn't over, as you mentioned. Your the distribution and and releasing of this in the spring. Can you talk a little more about that? How are you going to do that? How can we get involved with that? And so yeah. Well, we, our website is live. I mean, it's been live for a while, but we redesigned it recently, a place to stand movie.com. And, and if anyone is interested in being a part of and getting it out there, getting it into the places that um, where it can make a difference, where it could be used, they can contact us now. I mean, we're, there are, you know, we're doing small private screenings for people who are interested. Um, we're we're open to, to sharing the film and some of the curriculum and uh, with uh, teachers if they're willing to if they want to use it now uh, just to get just to get it tested and to see how it works and uh, the the plan though is well there's a lot of elements to it and but but in the spring in April we have a a big I'm calling it the big release and as of now we're we're going to be setting up uh, as many screenings as possible in the month of April around the country. Some, some theaters, um, but really anywhere that uh, someone is interested. It could be like just local theaters, it could be schools, universities, prisons, community centers, libraries. We're going to just try, we're going to work to set up as many of these as possible and, uh, and do it in a grassroots way. Uh, we, we will be through this, we will, we're also submitting to film festivals and we're going to seek a national television broadcast and uh, schools and partnerships with organizations in a more methodical way. But and then beyond that, Beyond that, is we're just looking to partner with as many organizations as possible to distribute the film and and use it. Like we, we want we want the, the movie and the the books to help other organizations uh, educate and inspire. So so it's not just like it's not just the movie and then it's done, but using the film to to help other work other kind of work within the same sphere. Very cool. I, we want to kind of wrap up here. I, one question I had I was thinking a while ago, but might be worth doing, is to, I think all three of you have seen screenings of the film with an audience. What, what 
do you remember the audience response being? What? Oh, I just I just got a chill because I, uh, we've done three that I've been at. Um, no, 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 we've done more than that. But this, we had th three big, um, three big bigger screenings like the world premiere and the, this LA premiere uh, that were they weren't. Um, these were just the, the first ones, and and there were a few others around the country, but. I mean, it was it's it was all so positive. I mean, that's that's what struck me. I mean, people really came up, people crying and thanking me and Jimmy, and um, people really moved. And I mean, for me, the one the one that really stood out was when we were in LA. We, the the screening was hosted by this organization called Street Poets, and they use poetry. To kind of help draw, to to steer gang kids away from that life, and towards poetry and writing, uh, and they were they they were a really big supporter of the film, uh, very generous supporter, and they wanted to host a screening, so we said, okay, sure, that'd be great, and and after after the screening, there was this one guy who talked in the Q and A, he's in his 20s or so, and he was telling us about how he was at one point addicted to like seven different drugs, alcoholic, like troubled kid, went to prison, got out, and, um, and you know, he, he found poetry and he found a purpose. And he was saying, but in, in the last months, he was like, in the last months I've been having, I've been struggling to feel my humanity. Like I've been really struggling to feel that, and watching this movie made me reconnect with my humanity. And and he was like breaking down, like he was really soft in in this in the audience, like telling everyone. And then I talked to him afterwards, and he was just thanking my, he was just shaking my hand and saying thank you, just thank you, thank you. And I'm I'm sure he said the same to Jimmy. And it was for me, it was like that's. That's what I hoped for. Like that's what I hoped the movie could do, uh, because I know the book does that, and and I hope that the movie would have the same kind of power, and that was proof that it does. So that that to me was the by far the most profound um, affirmation that that we achieved what I hoped we would with with the movie. A great story. Um, we could end there, but <laughs> Denise or Kim, anything else to add? No, I, I don't have any more to add. I think that's a great place to end. <laughs> great. Okay. Well, thank you um, so much. Uh, if, and and it's great to hear that this is just starting all again. <laughs> <laughs> and your, notion, your notion that this movie is now there to help other organizations. And connection to the prison and the literacy is all, all really great stuff. So thank you, all three of you, and Chris, thank you for pushing us to do this. <laughs> um, and so normally, I uh, will say here at the end, uh, we are teachers teaching teachers uh, every Wednesday evening, except when we have a wonderful guest from uh, Germany. Which, uh, so it was well worth <laughs> spending our Saturday morning and afternoon with you. Thank you so much. But we're uh, Wednesday evening, 9 p.m. Um, Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Pacific Time. Uh, we are uh, Teachers Teaching Teachers. We we broadcast over the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network. Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier um, are worth mentioning in uh, setting up that network. Join us um, other times. And, and I think maybe we'll look to check in with you all again when we uh, hear about some other distribution and use of the film in classrooms and so forth. Next stop, um, Kim and Denise, we'll see you in, uh, or I'll see you, I think, in uh, in Washington or wherever that place is near Washington, <laughs> where we'll be. Oh, me too. I'll be there too. Oh, you'll be there too. Yeah, great. Good. So we'll see you there. And, okay. and I just saw this. What? Oh. So Oh, I just saw this thing that, that Chris wrote in the in the chat. Um, just for more information on the spring launch, for now people can go to our website, uh, placestandmovie.com, and they can sign up for our mailing list, and we'll send updates. Great. 
Thank you. Thank you. See you.